has given us a bit of hope that there, we, we did not hear such a positive voice for a long time talking about Europe as we did over the last few months from Emmanuel Macron. And it has been very refreshing and very, very uh, invigorating. And uh, he really has insights uh, into, as I said, the, the, the scenario in France um, that uh, are extremely interesting indeed and extremely uh, informative and insightful. So without further ado, Pierre, merci d'être venu encore une fois. Thank you. Thank you. Vous. As you can imagine, uh, I come here with the a great relief and uh, uh, the result and, and maybe if the result had been different I might have asked for political asylum in, <laughs> in Ireland. <laughs> uh, I'll try to explain first of all why and how Emmanuel Macron won this election. He had three um, qualities. One is audacity, second one is intuition uh, and the third one is sheer luck. Uh, and, and it's the mix of the three that has produced this result. The audacity is that he did what every political analyst and expert in the country said had never been done and would not work. That means uh, someone who has never been elected before, never run even a campaign. Um, and you have to remember the biography of all presidents we've had. You know, Chirac was the mayor of Paris. He was a prime minister. He, had the, uh, he was the leader of the party uh, uh, before becoming president. And the uh, <coughs> common ideas was that you need to run a career, uh, start uh, down, and, and, and uh, go up the ladder. Uh, he decided to blow up that. Secondly, um, everybody thought that you could not run an election without one of the established political parties. Uh, and, and he, for example, refused. He was invited to join the socialist primaries, and he refused. Uh, and he uh, went on the campaign trail with a movement and not a party. Uh, his movement was created uh, exactly you know, just over a year ago. Um, to join, you just had to sign online, no payment, and, and, and he now has 285,000 members, registered members, which is different from uh, paid members of a political party because they, they're not organized the same way, but still, it's a very significant number, and a lot of these members uh, joined the campaign uh, in, in different capacities uh, with something like 3,000 local branches. So it's a, it, it has become a spontaneous uh, organization that you, you could not imagine a year ago. And, and obviously the third thing is that uh, he went without uh, uh, allies. You know, uh, no one was backing him in the political uh, sphere at, at the beginning. Um, and, and, and so all these three conditions, uh, you had to be very self-confident and very uh, audacious to, to, uh, to think that you can make it with that. And uh, so many, you know, there have been a, a lot of videos online recalling what politicians had said uh, all along, you know, that uh, the bubble will blow up and uh, uh, he will uh, not resist the first uh, uh, test of uh, uh, campaigning and so on. He did it, and he got elected. So that's um, unprecedented in, in French politics. A lot of comparison has been made with Obama, but even Obama you know, was in, in, in one of the two uh, dominant parties. So um, um, even if, if there are a lot of parallels, and, and Obama, as you know, maybe supported him during the campaign, uh, which was also unprecedented. Intuition, I said, because he understood that uh, there was a, a, a change of paradigm in the country. Uh, that's the reason why he refused to join the, the primaries of the socialists, which he might have been able to, to win, not sure, uh, because the primaries usually uh, are leaning more to, to, to the, the left than, than to the center. But he might have, uh, and, but he understood that this game was, was reaching uh, the end. Uh, that the, the French uh, voters were absolutely fed up with the uh, swing that we've had for the past 30 years 
where uh, the, the right fails, you go to the left, the fa left fails, you go back to the right, and so on. And the last two presidents, Sarkozy and Hollande, one from the right, one from the left, have been the caricature of this uh, back and forth with promises of breaking with the past uh, that were not kept. And, and his intuition is that people are ready to do what many politicians before him said, but maybe prematurely, that you can go above uh, that, that shift, that split between right and left, and you can offer something that, that maybe is more pragmatic and more uh, program-based and not ideology-based. Uh, part of, of this came from the debate on, on one of his reform, um, uh, one of the laws that he had uh, introduced in Parliament, and he said it in his book and, and, and in many interviews, uh, some people from the right came to him and said, uh, your reforms are really good, uh, I'm 100% with you, but as you know, uh, our party is against it, so I will vote against it. And, and he said, but this is you know, something, mm. and, and, and it created such a, a deadlock that um, that's why uh, Manuel Valls, the prime minister, used decrees, I mean, an, an, uh, an element in the constitution that allows to bypass parliament and, and get the, the and, and he, when he felt that he had a majority, uh, a political majority to support the reforms, uh, but because of that party politicking, uh, it was impossible. The sheer luck is obvious. Um, as you know, a year ago, people, you know, all the cafe discussions in, in France were, you know, are we condemned to have the same people all over again? You know, people have been in politics for 30, 40 years and, and who haven't produced anything new. And, and, and what happened? Uh, uh, Sarkozy lost in the first round of the right wing primaries, and Hollande was so unpopular that he could not even uh, run again. Uh, then we had Juppé, who was the front runner of the right wing primaries and the favorite of the opinion polls for months and months and months, and, and all of a sudden he loses. Uh, then you have François Fillon, who wins the uh, primaries and who falls on, on his own uh, scandal, uh, as you probably heard. And uh, uh, Manuel Valls on the left uh, thinks that he is going to be. Uh, the savior of the Socialist Party, and he loses the primaries. So you have a situation where every favorite falls on the way. And not only that, but the chosen candidates are of both the traditional right and the traditional left are so far from the center. Fillon is, was very conservative with a very uh, liberal program. Uh, Amon uh, was a very uh, uh, left uh, uh, at the left of the uh, Socialist Party, which left uh, a, a huge uh, center gap uh, uh, for Macron to, to occupy. And, and the last piece of luck that he had is François Bayrou, who is the, the centrist, historical centrist candidate, who uh, was expected to run and, uh, and to lose, uh, but Everybody thought that he had such an ego that he could not imagine not running and leaving to a 39-year-old guy uh, the place that he, he, he thought uh, he was legitimate to occupy. And, and, uh, uh, and to everybody's surprise, uh, he put his ego in his pocket and he decided to back Macron. Uh, so uh, all these events were totally unpredictable. Uh, and, and have taken everybody by surprise and produced the, 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 the accumulation of, of uh, uh, luck and, and uh, small uh, events that produced uh, uh, an opening for, for Macron to, to win. Uh, so, you know, luck is an important part of, uh, of success and, uh, and he, he has had his, 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 uh, more than his share. But you have to add those three elements to understand what happened. His strongest point is himself. You know, that's uh, undisputable. Uh, you've had the kind of uh, um, uh, both the, the age is obviously important. This uh, uh, jump, in uh, generational jump, is, is, is really a key to understand. Um, and with this generational jump comes the optimism, uh, because he 
has, you know, France is supposed to be the most pessimistic country on earth, uh, more than uh, more than Afghanistan, which had been at, at war for 30 years, and uh, and this is the mystery of opinion polls. Uh, uh, and, and suddenly you have a, a young man who says uh, you know, positive things, uh, believe in the future. I mean, uh, Obama-like uh, positiveness. Yes, we can. Uh, but uh, it worked. And, and, and suddenly people started listening and said, you mean we're not doomed? <laughs> you know, it was a kind of new, new thing uh, that, uh, that part of the country was ready uh, to hear. Um, he has a personality that is a, a strange mix of uh, someone who studied philosophy. He was even the assistant to a philosopher on, on uh, writing a book. Uh, banking, he was an investment banker with uh, Rothschild. That's, uh, uh, that was remi reminded to him uh, <laughs> enough uh, as a sin. Uh, but that means he's, he's, he's worked in the private sector, even if... Banking is a special activity, uh, and uh, <coughs> technocracy and politics. And this strange mix is, is very different, gave him a very different outlook from professional politicians. You know, you, you've had people like, take Francois Fillon, uh, you know, he's never worked outside politics in his life. Uh, in, in 40 years of career, never. You know, he finished uh, his studies, he became parliamentary assistant, then uh, a member of parliament, then uh, uh, head of local government, and then prime minister. I mean, he's never taken the metro uh, in his life and doesn't know the price of, uh, of uh, uh, baguettes. Uh, uh, and, and all this... He lives in the chateau. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> And, and, and that uh, has been something that you know, was an asset for, for him. Uh, the second thing is, is you know, he was quite blunt about his program. He never you know, tried to hide um, uh, Europe. Uh, you know, he said, if you uh, are pro-European and you put it under the carpet, uh, you lose. So he went out, uh, European flag, um, one week before the first round, he was in Nantes, and, and maybe you saw the pictures, he was there with the European flag, waving it on stage in front of uh, thousands of people. It's unprecedented, you know, uh, probably uh, not since Delors, probably, uh, as, as anyone uh, campaigned on a pro-European platform. Uh, his economic program, there are really tough things on it that uh, are, are uh, um, not popular, like um, he, he, uh, he says, if you're, uh, if you're unemployed, you get two reasonable offers and you refuse, you're out of the unemployment uh, role. You know, uh, that's uh, not very French, I must say. Uh, it's more Thatcherian or Blair-like Blair uh, than, uh, than French. Um, he wants to cut 120,000 public service jobs. Uh, there again, it's not popular because people feel that um, the disengagement of public service in certain areas is producing National Front votes. And, and, uh, and so if you weaken uh, the public service, then you will uh, continue to fuel the, the far right vote. Uh, but he's defending it. Uh, you know, he's, he says in the next five years, we're going to have about half a million uh, civil servants who will, who will retire. And he's only thinking of not replacing uh, one in four, uh, which is uh, not, uh, and, and with gains in productivity with technology and so on, he says you don't weaken the, the public service by doing it. But, but he has um, put forward proposals that he knew were unpopular in the country. Um, but he has this positive approach to social issues, to society issues. You know, he's, he's, he's quite uh, open to um, uh, uh, to calm uh, the um, community relations in France, which have been very tense and, uh, and, and which uh, regularly uh, are provoking uh, tensions, and he's, he's got a very reasonable approach on that. So uh, th this mix has made him someone that you could not just dismiss as a liberal or as a, um, as a warmonger or whatever. Uh, he has captured the attention by the complexity. You know, everybody's made a joke on the fact that in his 
uh, he has a verbal, uh, um, I don't know how you say in Antique. English, tea, antique mm -hmm. in, in French. Uh, you know, when you repeat all the, you, oh, uh, yes. uh, how, how do you say that uh, in English? Uh, tick. A tick? Oh, so, oh, okay, we have the same word then. <laughs> and he says, or he says um, at the same time, you yeah. know. And, and that means uh, every time he says something, he says, he counterbalances with another argument. At the same time, uh, yeah, this is blue, but at the same time, it's red. You know? and, uh, and so people say, that means you don't, uh, have, uh, you don't make up your mind if you, if you say that. And his answer is also always that he takes into account the complexity of things. And, and so you know, he, he has come out with a, um, at the beginning, no one understood what he was saying. You know, he was like a, an intellectual in politics. Uh, even in the first debate, uh, was very interesting. Marine Le Pen scored uh, against him because he she, he had uh, one very long answer on something, and she took the floor and she said, "Mr. Macron, you've spoken for seven minutes. I haven't understood anything," <laughs> 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 which was a, a good one because we were all feeling the same <laughs> behind our screen. <laughs> but it, nevertheless, this complexity uh, speech, this. Um, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the fact that you don't take people for, uh, for stupids uh, has been an asset there again when it could have been really sunk his candidacy. And um, uh, that, that's, so that's the, the strong points of his personality. Obviously, he's, he, he, he won a decisive victory in, in, on paper, uh, but in reality, he is, you know, it's the reflection of a deeply divided country, because you you have to take into account the fact that uh, Marine Le Pen doubled uh, her father's uh, number of ballots. You know, she she got eleven, almost eleven million, when he uh, got six uh, fifteen years ago. Um, you have a higher abstention in the second round, and higher number of blank votes. Uh, these mo being both from Fillon's side, people who refused to join Marine Le Pen and who uh, didn't want to join Macron, and uh, probably more from the far left, from uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, who had 19.5% of the vote and who refused to give a mandate uh, saying, yeah, vote for Macron. He said that he himself would go to vote. He didn't say for whom. He said, I'm against Marine Le Pen, but he let his voters free, and, and part of them abstained, part of them voted blank. A small part, 6%, voted Le Pen, and 40% uh, voted Macron. So th this, is, this landscape is not very good, because it means, and all the analysis, the post-vote um, uh, analysis shows that people who voted for him out of support for his program are only 43%. That's, um, but in a way, that's the French system. You know, we have this two-round system, and we've always said, first round you choose, second round you eliminate. So in the second round, uh, the, the name of the game is vote for the, the, the one you dislike least, uh, not for uh, someone that, you, you, that makes you dream. You know, that's for the first round. Uh, where you have the choice of eleven, you had the choice of eleven candidates, and and uh, and so you you really had uh, an open game. But even on the first round, some people voted for him because they didn't <coughs> want out of strategic vote. You know, they didn't. Uh, lots of people, particularly on the left, didn't want a second round Fillon Le Pen uh, because of the scandals, and they said, you know, uh, if we are faced between a crook and, and a fascist, uh, we, that's not a really a, a, a very good choice. Uh, so they voted Macron saying, OK, at least we can live with this guy. Uh, it's better than, than Fillon. Uh, others, um, and that's where some of the divisions of today uh, arise from, because the, the left was split between those who chose Mélenchon, went to the radical left, and those who went to Macron for that reason, and it, let, you know, it left the Socialist Party to collapse with only 6%, and that was a really historical low. Um, but the result of that is that Macron, certainly 
is a legitimate president. You know, you cannot uh, dismiss someone who had 66% of the vote. It's, uh, uh, no one is disputing the fact that he is well elected. But there is dispute on what kind of mandate has he got and, and what kind of uh, uh, freedom of movement has he got to introduce the kind of reforms he's uh, talking about. Um, and, and that's the, the job of the legislative elections that we're going to have. You know, in, in uh, a month's time, exactly a month on the 11th of June, uh, is the first round of the legislative election. There again, it's a two-round system. And, but the difference is that in the presidential elections, the first two candidates stay for the second round. Uh, in the legislative elections, anyone above 12.5% uh, can stay. So you can have second rounds, and you're going to have second rounds with three or even four candidates who, who at least on paper have the capacity to stay, which is changing completely uh, the game of uh, the French political system. Because in the past, you had this automatic um, re -reunifi reunification of political families. You know, you would have a socialist candidate, a communist candidate, a, a green candidate, and the one who comes first gets the support from the other two. And, and, and uh, same on the right. You know, you have different families of, of, of the right. And the second one would be right against left with the support of people from other parties. This is over. Uh, we have a country divided in four, some people say even five, uh, and, and very little capacity to uh, unite uh, on the second round and to uh, uh, support each other. So th this makes this, these elections very unpredictable. Nevertheless, Macron has one advantage which is incredible, is that all the other political parties are in deep trouble. Uh, they are deeply divided following this presidential election. Take the National Front. Uh, you could say, you know, this is a historical vote, but at the same time, it's 10% less than, than she could have hoped for. Uh, if you spoke to, to her aides uh, before, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, they would say below 40% it's, it's a defeat. Mm -hmm. uh, above 40% it's a success. And some were dreaming of reaching 45%. So she got 34 um, So on one side she's, she's very high, on the other side she's not reached the, the type of uh, situation she was hoping for. And uh, today, you may have heard that Marion Maréchal Le Pen, the niece of Marine Le Pen, has decided to uh, pull out of politics. She's, she's uh, one of the two MPs they now have in Parliament, and she's not uh, going for her own, in her own constituency. And that's a big blow for them, because she represents a, a, a different political line from her aunt. Uh, Marine Le Pen uh, um, has made uh, a choice several years ago, which I think was very smart, uh, w which was to go on an anti-globalization platform, uh, anti-euro, anti-globalization, and to go for the working class in, in the de-industrialized regions. And that's where she scored very high. Um, and she took many pages from the left, from Mélenchon's book. You know, she's, uh, uh, she's using the same vocabulary as him, you know, the oligarchy and, uh, and these kind of, uh, of words. But Marion, the, the niece, she's from the South, representing the constituency in the South, and that's another national front, more conservative and, and more uh, nationalist, anti-Islam, anti-immigration, uh, with the support of the former uh, French from Algeria, uh, who are very uh, anti-Arabs, uh, 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 the sh small shopkeepers on law and order issues, security issues. And that's the traditional National Front. That's the father's, uh, Jean-Marie Le Pen's National Front. She hijacked the National Front and, and moved it in, into another direction. And the, there's a lot of people within the party who think that this was a mistake, that we should, they should have kept to their original values and programs. So by pulling out, she's saying, you know, uh, first of all, it's a slap in the face of her aunt. And secondly, she's uh, <coughs> positioning herself as a potential uh, leader in, yeah, she's 27, so she, she has the time to come back 
uh, and the National Front is a family business. You know, it's not. Uh, uh, she has the support of the gra of her grandfather. Uh, I mean, it, it is very weird, but it's, that's the way it works on the far right. Um, so the National Front could suffer from those divisions. Uh, uh, I was reading in, in the French media this morning that so the, her voters in her constituency are saying, you know, without her, I don't vote National Front. So it could damage their chances um, because they will appear as a normal party with their own divisions and factions. Uh, the Les Républicains, the, the traditional right, uh, is in deep trouble because they've, this was, as, as they themselves, themselves said, this was an election they could not lose. And, and, they, and they transformed it into an election they could not win, uh, which is quite a performance. And, 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 um, and the, the, the problem is that when, the, when Fillon became discredited, they, they could not... Uh, find the, the consensus within the party to replace him in time or, and to force him out. Uh, and he was smart they enough. They should have done. They should have done, and they, 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 they could have retained the chance because the country, normally the country was going to vote right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, but Fillon was very smart. He did this uh, rally in Paris, he, he, he mobilized. The, the really the right, the hard right of the party, the people who had great networks, who, who were uh, very active in um, fighting the gay marriage bill uh, three years ago. Yeah, you had a lot of street demonstrations and so on. This is the uh, conservative Catholic uh, circles, and and that's these are the people who filled the Trocadero Square in Paris uh, and gave uh, Fillon the the small push that he needed to stay. And, and so they lost, and they lost heavily. And today they are morally bankrupt. You know, they are they are really destroyed. And and Macron is probably going to give them the final blow by picking one of theirs as prime minister. Uh, we're going to know on Monday who is going to choose as prime minister. But um, the uh, rumor mill of Paris has it that it, it could be. Uh, he, that he will take someone from the Republican Party and not uh, one of the, the former socialist or new personality. Um, and it could be the mayor of uh, Le Havre, uh, Edouard Philippe, who is a, uh, a, a young man. Uh, well, I don't, I don't know what it means to be young now with a, <laughs> when you have a 39-year-old president because Edouard Philippe is 47, so he, you can say he's old. He's old. <laughs> but still, uh, he... Uh, he was the spokesman for Juppé during the campaign for the primaries, and he refused to accompany Fillon. Uh, and so, uh, and, and he's a uh, yeah, quite respected uh, personality. Le Havre is a very interesting town because uh, it, it had it, it was communist in in the past. It's a it's a working class uh, uh, hard town that was captured by the right, and Edouard Philippe is, is considered a, a very good mayor, been re-elected uh, with a huge margin, and um, and he has respect from both right and left, and uh, and he would be a good choice. The result of his choice would be that the Juppé uh, clan within the Republican could just uh, leave the party uh, to to its own transformation, um, but join with the presidential majority. Uh, they control, at the moment, they have 30 to 40 MPs who follow Juppé and who supported him during his campaign, and that's not insignificant. So that, that's the situation on the Republican. The Socialist Party you know, is in uh, terminal illness, um, and yesterday Manuel Valls, the former prime minister, uh, said on the radio that it was dead, uh, and he did something very strange: is that he he went on the radio and said, "I'm going to run uh, not as as a socialist, but as presidential majority with Macron." And Macron's people said, "Really? Uh, you should register online. <laughs> we don't like know everybody you, else. like everybody else, and, and 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 it's too bad because we've already selected someone for your constituency." <laughs> And so this was really a humiliation, and, and, and Valls, uh, Valls and Macron you know, are, are too similar in a way, and, uh, and, and there was probably no, no room for two crocodiles in the same uh, pond as, as uh, Oufouet Boigny used to say in, in Ivory Coast. 
Uh, and now, this morning, uh, Benoit Hamon, who was the candidate, announced that he was going to launch a movement because the new trend now is, is to uh, uh, forget parties, you launch movements. And uh, uh, to try to reunify the, the left, uh, which is a hopeless uh, uh, goal. Uh, and then you have Mélenchon, who had a very good campaign, who is in the middle of a total depression because he thought he could make it, and he, he missed the second round by on, only 600,000 votes, which is not much in France. And... Um, and, and he's, um, he's fighting now with the Communist Party. Um, you know, the Communists are small in France uh, nowadays, but they still control a few cities. Uh, um, they have a few MPs. They have a, 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 an apparatus, you know, they have a, a party structure, a structure which, the, uh, which Mélenchon, Mélenchon operates more than, like a sect. You know, he's a guru and, and people follow him. And... Uh, so the communists are, are very keen to have uh, to keep their constituencies, and they started campaigning uh, right from Monday after uh, supporting Mélenchon in the campaign. They started on their own candidates for the election, and they put Mélenchon's figure uh, po uh, portrait, sorry, uh, photograph on their posters, and Mélenchon uh, announced on Monday that he was taking them to court to take uh, his picture off the posters. Uh, the, the, you know, they were allies during the uh, presidential campaign, and on Monday they are fighting in court. Uh, so there again, nothing very convincing. And the only uh, game in the in in the in the town is en marche, is the uh, party uh, or, or the transformation transformed movement that's turning into a party. Now it's called La République en marche of uh, Emmanuel Macron, and we have still have to see what it means. Um, because it's it's one thing to elect uh, a, a charismatic leader; it's another thing to get uh, a majority in, in parliament in uh, 289 constituencies. And um, so tomorrow they're going to announce the list of 577 candidates, uh, which were selected in a very weird process. Unorthodox. Unorthodox. Yes, you could say so. Uh, they've opened the website. And, um, and you could register online to be a candidate. Uh, all you had to do is like joining Apple or IBM. Uh, you put your CV, uh, you put uh, uh, an official paper showing that you have no criminal record, and a motivation letter, uh, like an HR process. Yeah. And, uh, do, you have to be, do you have to be a French citizen? Because we may have some candidates around this day. I, I'm afraid you have to be a French citizen. <laughs> and uh, Sorry, and they, they received 15,000 applications, 15,000, uh, which are being processed at the moment. Uh, they are in the finishing uh, hours of it uh, by a committee led by a man who is... Uh, Highly respected, called Jean-Paul Delevoye, who is a 75-year-old former minister with Jacques Chirac. Uh, then he was the head of some consultative bodies. He's, he's a honest man who's, who's really uh, has no um, shadow uh, or no uh, uh, no problems no, uh, in his career. Highly respected, and he's the head of that committee that is choosing uh, the candidates. They have two criteria. Uh, half of the candidates must come from the civil society. That, that means no political uh, activity before. And half women and half men. So with those criteria in mind, and the others should be from all political uh, background, right and left. Uh, this is, you know, it, it sounds uh, uh, like uh, the, the Italian five-star movement, you know, it's a, a bit this kind of thing, except that it's not on a populist agenda, it's on a centrist, uh, reasonable uh, agenda. So that's a big gamble, whether it, it can really work, uh, rejuvenate uh, politics, bring new faces. Uh, he has one asset, is that there's a new law that uh, is now um, in place for this election, is the, the um, you cannot have several hats. You cannot be a mayor and a, a member of the National Assembly at the same time, which was 
a, an element of sclerosis of the political system. People were, for 30 years, you were both deputy and mayor, and, and, uh, and, and you would freeze, you know, you had the local barons uh, who had their constituency, their city, and, and, and things were impossible to, to change. And by breaking that, you force people to choose. Most uh, people who were in that category went back to mayor uh, office and abandoned their national um, position, which means that you, you have at least a third of the constituencies where there's no standing MP. It's a new, you know, you start from zero. And, and, and that's an advantage for uh, the newcomers. Uh, because they don't have to face someone who has uh, you know, local uh, uh, roots for a, a long time. And um, uh, Emmanuel Macron is so self-confident that last year uh, he was talking to uh, three journalists, including a friend of mine, in June. That was off the record, uh, after uh, um, you know, late at night. And he told them, uh, he was still a minister, um, uh, he told them, I'm going to run for presidency. I'm going to be facing Marine Le Pen in the second round. I'm going to be elected, and I will have an, over, an overall majority. So he's done the first three of the four <laughs> uh, things he said. And, and uh, uh, useless to say that the journalist started laughing and said, you're, you're, you're a dreamer. <laughs> uh, and, um, and Monday morning, first opinion poll in France uh, after the presidential election about the legislative election. And who comes first? En Marche. 26% uh, of vote intentions, even without knowing the candidates. Um, and the socialists are down to, you know, to uh, 5%. I mean, it's, um, it's, it's, there's a something w which, uh, you know, we have to understand that this is not just uh, a, a smart maneuvers by a smart politician. It's an earthquake that has um, changed the, 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 the mentalities that people are, for the first time, ready to try something else. And, and in a way, the second round was two candidates who were telling the French, we have to try something else. On one side, we destroy everything, we leave Europe, and we, we see what happens. <laughs> and on the other side, someone who says, we do have to change, but uh, in a reasonable way, we reform, we work hard, uh, we build Europe, and we... Uh, we will change this country and bring it back to, uh, uh, to better days. And, and that's very important, that uh, the two offers were offers of change uh, outside the political parameters that we had had for 30 to 40, 50 years. And that's really um, quite uh, significant. Um, but obviously, uh, this will not solve the problems that he's facing overnight. Uh, and particularly, you know, there are three angers. He used the word anger in his first speech. You know, he said, I know there is angry, anger in the country. There are three different angers in this country. Uh, one is the losers of globalization. You know, the people from the northeast and southeast, people who voted Marine Le Pen, uh, people who come from regions where industry has gone, uh, the public service is, is uh, slowly uh, being uh, uh, concentrated, cut. cut, and so on. And, and we say, okay, uh, if we are, you know, we don't count in the, you know, the social <coughs> contract in this country that we don't leave anyone uh, on the side of the road, it's over, uh, then we vote for the most extreme. That's, mm. more, you know, that anger is, is number one. The second one is the suburbs, you know, the sons of immigrants who are bitter because they say this country, the society has never given us a chance to, to enter the society. And, and, they, and that ang anger expresses itself regularly through riots or through uh, incidents with the police, tensions and so on, and is part of the explanation for why uh, young you know, French-born uh, sons of immigrants have gone to Syria, returned and, and, and killed other French people. You know. Uh, it's not, obviously not the only explanation, but it's part of the equation. And the third anger, or fear more than anger, is the middle class that, that sees everything going down. You know, uh, fear of uh, uh, that your children are not going to live better than, uh, uh, for the first time in 150 years, 
the next generation is not guaranteed to live better than the present one. So these, these, these three hangers, no one, none of the candidates was addressing the three together. Marine Le Pen was only building on one. Um, Macron was certainly talking to the middle class, a little bit to the suburbs. He has something in his program that are uh, pretty smart on that. You know, he wants to, for example, to cut the number of kids in the class uh, in class for the the most the poorer districts of those uh, suburbs uh, to 12, uh, which is uh, you know, and and school is the key, and the school system has failed to to uh, integrate uh, those children, and and I think that's a very smart uh, move. Uh, is also you know giving fiscal advantages for people who recruit in those uh, districts, um, but he's not talking to uh, or when he talks to to the first group, uh, sorry the um, uh, people from uh, the the industrialized zones, he's they don't listen to him because he's a caricature of of what they they feel is is. Uh, the cause for their uh, problems. So uh, whether he can, as president, show, as he said in his first speech, that he can be inclusive and that he's not going to be the, 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 candidate, the president of the winners versus uh, the losers, uh, that's his big challenge because you don't change that situation overnight. And, and we have a situation in the country where this is really um, a, a, you know, the polarization. But in a way, that's what we saw in the U.S. with yeah. Trump's election. You know, it's, a, it's the same uh, divide uh, between uh, winners and losers of globalization. And in a way, like in the U.S., when, when Trump was saying, you know, this, the economy is in shambles, and, and we were all watching and said, but that's not true. You know, the economy in the U.S. is doing pretty well. When you are in Paris, Bordeaux, Toulouse, uh, Nantes, uh, Rennes, uh, Lille, uh, Strasbourg, Lyon, uh, in the big metropolis in France, you don't think that uh, the, the country is in trouble. Uh, restaurants are full, shops are full, uh, and Marine Le Pen only gets uh, five to, to seven percent of the vote in those areas. You know, so you see really different situations, uh, a, a two-speed country, even more, more than two-speed, but uh, to make it short, two-speed country, uh, and, and those who are in the fast lane uh, don't vote Marine Le Pen. Uh, I live in the 10th arrondissement of Paris. She got 4.9 percent. That's nothing. Yeah, it's irrelevant. Uh, and um, and and if you are in uh, in in Abomont, where Marine Le Pen is is probably going to run, uh, she will get 65 percent probably. Uh, so you you have this huge social, cultural, uh, and outlook on 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 the world, uh, which is a very uh, very, very strong. So how can you solve that? And that's going to be a hard work for many years. Uh, but, but you know, in, in a very constrained environment economically, even if things are going better at the moment uh, than they have been for the almost since the uh, 2008 crisis, uh, the, the speed of uh, job creation uh, and, and growth is uh, getting better, particularly, for example, the construction sector is at the highest for 10 years. And, and uh, uh, the strange and, and bitter uh, thing is that Hollande uh, was hoping that what is happening now could have happened two years ago. And it was slower to pick up than, than uh, what he was hoping for. And if it had happened two years ago, he could have been a candidate, probably, going to people saying, you know, you've made sacrifices, but the results are here. So it's Macron who is going to, that's another of his luck, is uh, yeah, yeah. coming at a time when the economy is picking up. One last word is, is Europe, uh, because that's uh, obviously mm. um, the, key, the key mm. uh, and very central to, to his personality and his program. Um, as you probably noticed on Sunday night, he appeared at the Louvre with the Ode to Joy, you know, and the National Front was quick to tell him, you know, you, you are a traitor, you, you don't put the Marseillaise, you put the European anthem. Um, yesterday for, for Europe's Day, he had a message, I, I saw it uh, on Twitter, uh, he had a recorded message, video message uh, on Europe uh, that was widely uh, shared and that was you know, so positive that I don't remember having heard anyone probably since uh, Mitterrand uh, saying those words like that. Or, or Roca, uh, but that's uh, you know that's 25 years. Yeah. Um, 
and and so uh, he's going to Berlin next week. Uh, he's made the rapprochement with Germany uh, a key element to to his uh, program, and and the Germans are are very eager um, and maybe a little bit apprehensive in some circles. Uh, built the. Uh, a tabloid newspaper had a headline saying, how much will Mr. Macron cost us? <laughs> <laughs> um, because, you know, he's talking about, you know, p uh, reinforcing the Eurozone, which means uh, sharing part of, you know, that Germany will, will have a, a larger part of the burden. He's criticized the surplus of Germany. Is, yeah. So, but she, uh, Angela Merkel, I think is relieved, uh, is so relieved to have uh, first of all, not to have Marine Le Pen, but also to have someone who says, and, and that's what he said during the campaign and repeated, uh, that he, he knows that to, to work with Germany, he has to restore France's credibility, and, and particularly economic credibility, and introduce the reforms that the country has not made for years. So that's a good starting point. Uh, there's the, the, the noise, the rumors we hear from Berlin is that they're ready to start uh, introducing some joint approach even before the German elections when everybody thought that uh, it would have to wait September but uh, they, they, there, there could be surprises by the summer and certainly before uh, the end of the year we could have some you know relaunch of, of uh, uh, projects in Europe on uh, defense is, is started already but they, they, they will go further on uh, um, something that uh, Ireland might not like is uh, fiscal fiscal issues and um, um, we're watching <laughs> on on the eurozone is very keen to go uh, to deepen the the, uh, the the functioning of the eurozone and um, and one tricky issue that's very uh, political in France is the uh, detached workers um, you know it, it was a big issue in the in the uh, campaign we have uh, officially 350,000 uh, detached workers in France, mostly from Poland or Czech Republic uh, or Romania, uh, who are um, you know, aligned on their country of origin system. And, and that's creating you know, a lot of uh, tension. Uh, it's be, you know, Marine Le Pen has used that a lot. So he has promised not to tear it down because that's what she was um, she was proposing, but to reform it and make it yeah, more acceptable uh, for French workers too.